You know, one of the things I didn't know going into this book, um, having watched the the show on AMC, was just how many voyages, even prior to this, people were taking to the Arctic. Because you talk about some of these guys' history and some of their other travels to the Arctic. And I'm just wondering, you know, with all the dangers and the history of danger involved in this place, um, what was so great about going where it made the risk worth it for those who went all the time? Well, the, you know, the, the strange part about it to me is that at the beginning, the Admiralty, which oversaw the Royal Navy, which was the, you know, the greatest naval force on Earth in its mm-hmm. day, was discouraging uh, uh, Lady Jane Franklin, Sir John Franklin's wife, uh, by then widow, mm-hmm. was mm-hmm. discouraging her effort to stir up interest because they took the attitude of, you know, just hang on. They've got a lot of food and uh, they're experienced men. They can survive for a few years. They'll probably pop out the other end in Russia and everything will be fine. So at the start, it was very slow to to become a manhunt. But once it got going, uh, you know, it, it carried on uh, full into the 21st century. There, there's one number from 1847 to 1859, there were no less than 36 expeditions that sailed in search of these men. Yeah. That's an extraordinary hunt. Yeah, and you know, the, the, the search for the Northwest Passage itself definitely came with risk, but uh, Sir John Franklin had some reputation, it seems, some political clout that he wanted to rebuild. And in your book, you talk a little bit about how this was kind of his way to get it. But even now, I kind of tied to my first question it's like why this was there was there not anything else he could have done or maybe maybe it just this was a guarantee that if he pulled this off he could get all that back and then some right now i should say uh, as a journalist i approached this whole story uh, perhaps uh, with with an element of suspicion that is just drilled into journalist minds the the world of politics is dirty Mm-hmm. As we know, you know, the, we, we live with it every day in the news. In the 19th century, Sir John Franklin had made a big name. He was a national hero as a polar explorer. Yeah. That was business and he knew it well. But he was persuaded to become a governor of a backwater, uh, a backwater in those days. Uh, I've, you know, forgive me if you're uh, in Tasmania, um, but it was called Van Diemen's Land in those days. And the British wanted a governor, and they said to Sir John, uh, you know, how about you? So he took it, but it was a mistake because he didn't understand the politics of the place, and he was politically stabbed in the back. So it was his wife, uh, by and large, that encouraged him to go back to the Arctic to rehabilitate his name. The, the logic, I think, is simple. You, you became a national hero in the Arctic. You were besmirched by these cheap political power plays when you were a governor, just go back to the Arctic and restore your name. Mm. It may find the Northwest Passage in the process. Well, and what about um, some of the crew members? You talked a little little bit about some of the people that found their way aboard the ship to serve in the ship. Were a lot of those men required to serve, or did a lot of them volunteer as well? You know, of course there's a mix. And uh, in writing the book, I spent some time uh, speaking with um, both historical experts, archaeologists, and others, but also mariners who understand the world of the seaman well. And I was cautioned uh, by a seaman who's in the book, who's, who's one of the most obsessive modern hunters uh, for the what were then the lost two ships. And I was imagining these men as brave heroes who had sacrificed their lives for human knowledge and exploration. And he said, you know, hold on a second here. A lot of these men are just uh, sailors trying to make a living, mm-hmm. and and they could make a pretty good living, assuming you get home. And there's a rather touching letter from the ice master that I quote in the book to his wife, a guy named Reed, said, you know, uh, people think I'm crazy, uh, but they don't know ice as well as I do, Yeah, which is, you know, <laughs> that, that's kind of an ouch moment. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, but But the touching part is he said, you know, there's a real chance that we're going to complete the Northwest Passage and return heroes, and Sir John is going to take care of us. So there's that sense of, if if we take the risk, I take the risk on behalf of the family, 
this may be a big payoff at the end, and Sir John, the national hero, will take care of us for the rest of our lives, and everything will be golden. I, I think any any person who's trying to pay the bills every day, to keep their families alive, keep a roof over their heads, can understand that temptation. Sure. Well, in the AMC series, you know, the, the focal point for much of it is uh, Captain Francis Crozier. And in the very beginning, uh, he and uh, Sir John Franklin have a disagreement on the route in which to search for the Northwest Passage. In fact, if I remember right, uh, in that scene, it's Crozier who was worried about taking a path that would get them stuck in the ice. Uh, do we know if there were intense disagreements between the crews on as far as something like that was concerned and, and, the, and going the right way so as not to get stuck in the ice? From the historical record, we know what uh, Sir John's instructions were. You know, people can imagine the Royal Navy is a, is a pretty strict operation, and everything is spelled out. And again, this is in the book. People can, can look at it. It spelled out in great detail w- what he's supposed to do. Yep. And, and, and we have a written record um, before the, the ships are abandoned of what they did in their first winter. And they did exactly as they were told. Mm-hmm. They headed north and did a circuit and came back down. So they did a small circle north and then south again in that first season. So the question people might ask is, well, if you're looking for a passage connecting the Atlantic to the Pacific, you're heading east to west, why would your instructions be to turn north? Mm -hmm. This is an interesting uh, scientific fact of the time, and it it lasted well past this period. Uh, There was a very strong scientific belief that at the top of the world, it was not solid ice. It was a temperate polar sea, a kind of a tropical paradise. Yeah. So the, the sense was if you can get through the wall of ice that, that whalers and others knew existed, if you could just get through that, it's clear sailing over the top of the world and you'd be fine. So the, the likely uh, conclusion is that Sir John's orders were to try to find that polar sea. And we also know from the historical record uh, that they discussed it on the ship, uh, you know, a letter sent home before they went missing said that they had discussed the possibility of an open polar sea at dinner, and Sir John said he didn't believe in it. Yeah. But he did follow uh, orders, it would seem. And when they get into trouble is that next season. Because, uh, and you know, this is even true today with climate change, the the, the weather is, is very variable. Um, you know, that you can have a stretch of very bad winters, and then you can have a period of, of ice breaking up and things are a lot easier. I think the thing that got Sir John and his men into trouble is that there was a stretch of unusually warm uh, uh, summers. So the breakup was bigger. But then they were hit, and we know this from Inuit uh, oral history, they were hit by one of the most severe winters and a stretch of them uh, in, in known Inuit history, which... Yeah do it's really cold and that's that's when they got stuck and the you know the, it wasn't the first time a royal navy vessel had been stuck in the arctic usually the ice would break up after a couple of winters and let them go this time it didn't happen so they had to abandon ship and try to walk out yeah and for those who might not know how long did they wait for the ice to thaw uh, which you know like you just pointed out it never did before they had to leave ship and try to figure out something else well, the, it is a couple of a couple of winters. So the 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 timeline is they leave in 1845 uh, on their journey, and then by um, 1846 they're beset in ice in on September 12th, and we know this from a note they left. And then 1847 the ships are still trapped in ice, and Sir John Franklin dies yeah. on 11th 1847. The the cause of death is not noted. But he was, uh, you know, he was aging and, and probably had heart trouble and that sort of thing. Uh, and and then, they, then they abandon ship after that. The intriguing part of the modern story, and this is something that's going to unfold through exploration uh, over the coming years of the, of the wrecks that have been discovered, is it seems that, those, that some men went back to the ships and tried to sail them out. Now, that is a matter of... Of conjecture, I'm a journalist, so I'm allowed to do those things. Yeah, 
But the early evidence, and again, we can discuss it, it's in the book, the early evidence is there that the shipwrecks were not found anywhere near where they were abandoned. Yeah. And it looks possible that they that somebody tried to sail them out, that they didn't drift to where they were wrecked. Which is really interesting when you think about, <laughs> when you ponder that for a few minutes. It truly is because the, you know, it would turn history on its head. Yeah. Uh, and then the next person who makes a TV you know, docudrama or or film uh, can write the story of of perhaps a mutiny or you know again as this this experienced mariner told me he said you know I'm a I'm a sailor I'm not going to die walking out of any place mm-hmm. I'm going to say screw this and go back to my ship if I, if I have to die I'll die on the ship and I that that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, and that's and that's what leads right into what I was uh, thinking because before getting your book and watching the show and seeing these guys uh, abandon the ship, I mean, they, you know, obviously early on they went on hunts and everything, but then next thing they're doing is trying to figure out alternative ways to get rescued, and that even includes not only abandoning ship, but they are pulling off the light boats, lifeboats, and filling them up with supplies and dragging them along the ice, and I was just, I was just floored by that because I just remember thinking, do they really think? that they can get somewhere where they can be rescued. Because one of the things the show really does a good job of, and one of the things I love about your book too, is, I mean, you really do a fantastic job explaining, you know, the depth of cold (laughs) and the impact it has on the body when you're, when you're out there just for a few minutes, even if you're wrapped up and, and uh, the best stuff at the time. Um, I'm just, I just found myself wondering, you know, do they really even know where they're going and do they really think that they're going to accomplish something or is, is this just a group of guys that, you know, are kind of on their last leg as far as keeping their sanity and this is all they got left is, well, we've been sitting here and maybe if we go somewhere, someone will help us get out of here. For a long time, there has been a persistent theory and I think, uh, you know, modern scientific evidence has pretty much debunked this theory, but it was that they had gone mad, mm-hmm. uh, probably because of lead poisoning uh, from the lead pipes that you know provided their fresh water, something like that, or from the from the sea, the lead that sealed the tin cans that their food was in. Yeah. But modern science has shown that the levels of lead uh, in in the bones of the men who were found buried uh, is no higher than any man for for that age of the period. The you know the the lead theory was was fed in part uh, by the, by the fact that these men had carried rather bizarre things from the ships at great effort things like writing desks mm-hmm. brass curtain rods things that you wouldn't immediately think men escaping for their lives would want to haul because as you pointed out you have to load up lifeboats or, you know, uh, what we would call lifeboats and then pull them with ropes over the ice, which is not easy, uh, you know, great distances. Why, one would ask, would any sensible man do that? Why not just travel light? Well, I, I can't answer that question. Yeah. But the again, the location of the wrecks suggests that not only were they not crazy, but smaller and smaller groups of men were performing greater and greater heroic acts trying to sail large, heavy warships out with with literally skeleton crews. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I think even in the series, even there, there's an element of kind of the supernatural. I think that's the point of the show, because I think they're going to do another one, another season, but it's going to take place like in a World War II uh, camp, you know, showing the you know the life of people in a concentration camp. Uh, and there's going to be a supernatural element to that. But I actually think this, tied to what you're talking about, and of course uh, the the tribes that lived in the area as well that you've brought up, that there was, even though in the show, they were supposedly causing, or I guess launching this this uh, supernatural beast that was going after all these guys. And it was apparent they didn't trust them. And, and you talk a lot about the book, about the rocky relationship between them and the, the white men coming to their land with these ships and their explorations. Um, but I think even though that part is kind of fictional, it, it does seem to not only fit with uh, the tribes there, but also that element of possibly going mad while you're out there, just scared of anything and everything. And because there's times where we all see this creature, 
But then next thing you know, they're shooting at it and there's nothing there. And I almost wonder if that's part of what's being portrayed there, that supernatural element, but also the going mad element. You know, the, the central thing that drew me to the, to the story of the search was a, an experience that I had up there because I'd been to the Arctic a few times mm-hmm. as a journalist. And, and I can tell you, when you stand alone, which is easy to do up there, out on the sea ice in the dead of winter, and all you can hear literally uh, is your own breath and, and maybe a whisper of wind, you get a very strong sense that you're not alone, that there's something there you can't see. Mm. Now, there there's a, a bit of science behind this because – because the nature of the atmosphere up there, uh, light and sound waves can be bent in such a way that literally you could hear the voice of someone who's quite a distance away, beyond sight, but the, the sound waves can travel so that you could hear it clearly. So there's a scientific explanation for it, in part, but the Inuit, even today, believe that there are spirits wandering up there. Yeah. Um, and you know, one of the, the most intriguing parts of the modern search is is an Inuit historian, a man named Louis Kamokak, yes. who's really a living link uh, between the traditional uh, Inuit way of life and, and, and modern way of life. He told me um, very clearly that he and others believed that the, the spirits, the ghosts of the lost Franklin men were haunting uh, King William Island, which is where they live, and and his goal was to stop the haunting, that that he wasn't he wasn't trying to find ships, in order, uh, you know, to to make a discovery. He wanted peace for his island. Mm. It's kind of a it gives me chills when I when I think about it, because it's not a it's not a simple ghost story. It is central to their view of the world. And again, having had a an, a weird experience that I can't explain. Yeah. You know, I, I think they're on to something. Yeah, and what's interesting is when we think about how long it took to find both the Erebus and the Terror, uh, I know uh, one of the things that you've pointed out is the Inuit knew, so, you know, because they've lived there and, and maybe even experiencing some of that as well, as well as finding pieces of the ship and any number of other things over the years, they kind of knew exactly where these things were, but there was kind of a communication breakdown or, or an unwillingness to talk to them or I guess include them in, in the uh, efforts to find them because apparently maybe if there was better communication with them, we might have found these ships and maybe more a lot sooner than we did. Some readers of the book have said to me, you know, that the first half uh, is kind of frustrating because one expedition after another goes looking and they don't find anything. Mm-hmm. And I say to them, you know, that that's intentional because I – I want you to get to the point where you want to throw the book at the wall yes. <laughs> because, because you'll find in the second half that it's really no secret where at least one of the ships is. Yeah. It's, simply, it's simply an arrogance, a hubris that members of the Royal Navy thought how could so-called savages, the Inuit, the people who they, they treated as less than human, how could they know better than us how to find other men of the Royal Navy? That just doomed the effort to find these men. Uh, and, and when they do find the first wreck in the 21st century, I don't want to blow it for, for readers, but when you find out the Inuit word for the little, tiny little remote island next to the wreck, you'll say, come on. Yeah. Um, but it is basically a flashing red sign that says, look here. Yeah. <laughs> Very, very true. Well, part of those uh, expeditions to find them uh, that was so fascinating, I mean, you know, it's it's one thing to have the Navy or whomever sending, you know, ships out there, but I was really impressed with uh, Sir John Franklin's wife. I mean, you know, in the series, you, you see her kind of begging them to search, and they're just kind of, eh, they'll be fine, or we'll we'll figure it out. We don't need you telling us what we need to do. But I mean, until your book, I didn't realize the extent of influence she had or what she was really even capable of when she decided she was going to start taking some matters into her own hands. So it was quite remarkable, especially for a woman in the 1840s and 50s. I, I completely agree. I was, again, you know, the a lot of this, the research on this book was discovery for me because I'm not in any way 
an expert on on exploration or naval history. So so as I researched it, I came to know her in a way I hadn't before. And I, I think she would be an extraordinary woman even today, yeah. alone in the Victorian era. She did things like, like break all diplomatic protocol and write to the then president of the United States of the day and basically challenge him mm -hmm. to join the search um, because at the time the, she had persuaded the Russian government uh, to do some searching. She was working on getting a bigger search by the British and she proposed to the president of the United States, you know, as a great Christian nation in her words, why not make this a three-way effort? Um, and it, it's very stirring stuff, her, her letter. And to imagine that she would dare the consequences and write to the president of the United States and ask for his help, uh, she not only did it, but she succeeded. She, she got the United States government to join in the search. And, you, you know, that's just part of it. The, there's a supernatural element with her story. Mm -hmm. She would try absolutely anything to find her husband. And so she also consulted clairvoyants, some of which I describe in the book. Some of them are clearly charlatans. The stories sound crazy of astral traveling and this sort of thing. But there is a ghost story that comes to her attention that involves um, the, the, what appears to be the spirit of a, of a child in Ireland who speaks through a sibling and produces a map which is incredibly accurate for a place that had not been mapped yet. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I invite any readers to read that part of the book and, and give me an explanation for it. Uh, but so far, nobody has. Who, who knows what is possible? M uh, modern science is discovering all sorts of things in quantum physics and, and other fields. Uh, one truly wonders, was it possible that in some way messages were being sent or, or clues were being found, uh, right or wrong, real or not, Lady Jane Franklin took that information, passed it on to her own searcher, uh, and he acted on it. And he's the one who ended up finding the only written record we have today of the surviving men and what they were planning to do, where they left the ships. Yeah, that's that's amazing. That really was something. And, you know, it, it makes you wonder, had she not been who she was, you know, what we would know and, you know, how much would actually be missing from this entire story of events. That's exactly right, because there are Inuit accounts of of documents, what sound like books or, or papers at least, simply being destroyed. They found them, they couldn't read them, they had no they meant nothing to them and they simply tore them up or threw them away. One wonders if Jane Franklin hadn't funded that expedition that found what is the only written record of the surviving men, um, you know, it might never have been found. It could have been completely lost to history. What is it about the discovery of the Northwest Passage that in your mind made it so treacherous? I mean, what what were people just getting fundamentally wrong? Does it go back to why are you going north and south when you could be going east and west? Or is it just is it just that people didn't have the proper understanding of the area? I mean, especially if you're thinking there's this tropical place in the, on top of the earth. Part of the reason, uh, in my mind, is, is what motivated the search for the Northwest Passage in the first place. Mm. Uh, you know, when the, when the Royal Navy uh, uh, helped win the, Na the Napoleonic Wars, there was no purpose anymore for a huge royal navy yeah so the people in charge were looking for a purpose to, and that became polar exploration so they're using former bomb ships huge vessels uh, and that's mistake one there's a voice which people will, will hear in the book of a minority view of the time that said if you're going to go look for a, a passage uh, through the the, uh, the the arctic the sensible way to do it is small and light so that if you do get trapped, the, the ice essentially lifts the ship up, they're not broken apart, and then when the ice melts, they, they sink back down again. And the second point of the minority view was travel with Inuit. Uh, use their clothing, use their knowledge, and you will find 
your Northwest Passage. The Royal Navy did the opposite. Um, so I, I think that's sort of it right there. Uh, it's kind of a duh moment. If you want to find a way through the Arctic, ask the people who live in the Arctic. <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll tell you where, where it freezes and where it doesn't uh, and, and what the easiest route is. And sadly, uh, Sir John Franklin himself knew the route along that hugs the coast. That's the, the western exit because he had explored that by land. Mm -hmm. What was missing and which, which he, it seems that his men found, this is a matter of debate, which will be solved by archaeologists, but it seems that his ships discovered that missing link in the middle. They simply failed to sail through it, which is the sad part of the story. Yeah, timing seemed to be against them along with everything else, along with, like you said, just certain decisions. You know, it just seemed like just elements of arrogance and ignorance and bad luck. <laughs> if they had just got through that middle roughly 300-mile section, yeah, uh, Sir John knew the way out. He'd seen it himself. Really something. Well, and it turns out, I guess we didn't get a, a successful um, pass through it until like, uh, like around 1906. Well, that, that's right, uh, which is a whole, di whole different story. Yeah. Um, but, you know, now with, with climate change, you know, there are huge, uh, not a lot of them, but an increasing number of, sh uh, you know, ocean-going ships that are moving cargo and such. And in the coming decades, that could be a busy place. Yeah. What's interesting to me is I read that you um, obviously were on one of the ships that uh, found Erebus. Is that right? That's right. What was that the day like? Well, the, the, the strange thing is they kept it a, a state secret, so yeah. I didn't find out until a few days later that this involves Canadian politics, uh, which again is in the book, um, but the, you know, the, the prime minister of the day wanted to make sure that he announced it to yeah. the world, uh, and so, so I found out about it literally from a public relations person whispering in my ear, telling me we found a ship, but you can't tell anybody, so... So you can imagine as a journalist, um, knowing that history has been made, but I'm the, I'm the last person allowed to say anything about it because the prime minister has to have a news conference some days later. And it was at that point that I was allowed to send my story to my newspaper. Well, that had to be a little mixture of frustrating, demoralizing, and exciting all at once. It is, but it feeds straight into the whole Franklin narrative because <laughs> the story is just rich with politics and yeah. Uh, and people making crazy decisions based on their own personal ambitions. And lost in all of this is 129 men who died yeah. tr trying to find you know, an important part of human geography. It, it just stuns me that even today, people are somehow able to, to make the sacrifice that those men made part of their own personal ambitions. Yeah. And, I, you know, it's it's been kind of interesting, too, to look back on just how, now that the ships have been found, uh, how some of that politics has come and gone, how people look back on those men and look back on Sir John Franklin and uh, Francis Crozier. I know there's like a, a statue of him and his memorial. Um, you know, people look to him now a little differently. Uh, for those who may not know, who might be hearing this story for the first time, or at least to this depth, and are going to get so much more from your book, um, how are those men and those leaders uh, aboard those ships looked at today, do you think? How are they remembered? You know, this is one of the elements that keeps the story alive for each new generation. For some periods of history, Sir John Franklin himself has been considered a bit of a buffoon that he was past his prime and that he wasn't thinking clearly and such. Um, I, I, I'm not so sure about that. There are others, and I think, you know, history is constantly revised. I, I think the more lasting legacy will be that he was, was a good commander because we have a, we have a written record, again, from, um, from one of the officers on the ship that his fellow officers liked him. They looked up to him. Yeah. Uh, they, they found him inspiring and, and a good commander. And so I think that people are going to, I hope, uh, find written records on those wrecks 
that shed much new light on exactly what was going on up there. And there is a reason to believe that's possible because archaeologists have their eyes. You have to understand they're moving very slowly underwater each season, which is very short, looking now at two wrecks. They first have to document where everything is before they touch anything. And then as, as they document things, then they can go deeper into the vessels and, and try to find containers that might have records in them. And there is one container I understand that they have their eye on, which uh, if I understand the description correctly is kind of like a seaman's chest, which is in the officer's mess, a small area where the officers would have eaten and probably an officer would have sat on that chest as a, you know, as a seat at table. A likely place where you would put records the experts uh, suggest. And again, these are very disciplined men. And there's, there's evidence on the second ship, the Terror, which was found you know, after the Erebus, mm -hmm. that everything was locked up very tight, which again, from the written record, is a matter of Royal Navy protocol. There's a very, very well spelled out sequence of events that must take place when you abandon a Royal Navy vessel. And by the look of it, this ship was locked up tight. Now, if that's correct, it was abandoned in an orderly fashion. So you can imagine that that men might have sealed in wax of the log books and other important records and put them in a container. So you know th this could be wishful thinking, but we will find out eventually. It's possible there's a written record, diaries, log books, other documents that will tell us precisely who was doing what, and then we're going to find out, were these men crazy, were they brave, were they disciplined uh, sailors, and I think we're going to find out the latter, that they were, were doing what they were supposed to do and thinking and trying to find their way out and get home to the people they loved. For those who, you know, especially just we all kind of associate the story with them getting stuck, do we have a sense as to when they actually sank? The, you know, the, the, the note I keep referring to is called the Victory Point Note because it was discovered uh, near a place called Victory Point, uh, which is on the northwest uh, shore of King William Island. The ships were abandoned off of that. That, that note was found in 1859 by an expedition that Lady Jane Franklin paid for. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's in that note that they describe things such as, you know, w when the ships were abandoned, uh, how many men were alive, and what their goal was. And their goal was to walk out, they said, um, to a place what was then known as Bax Fish River, which is on the continental mainland. And again, there are, there are several maps in the book which will show people this, but you can also see it on the internet. You can see how they... They tried to walk down the western shore of King William Island and then head across. And there's a, you know, the, uh, over ice, it would have been a fairly short journey to get to the mouth of Back's Great Fish River. And then it would have been a matter of navigating that river to the first Hudson's Bay outpost. Now, there's evidence, archaeological evidence, that some men uh, did get very close to, to Back's Great Fish River. Uh, who, who knows where the last men died? Yeah. The, uh, again, in the book, there's, a, there's an intriguing uh, Inuit traditional story which describes a ship in the area where the Erebus was found with smoke coming out of the chimney, and we know that they had uh, a chimney, uh, and, and the Inuit hunters who saw it were afraid to go close to the vessel. But one day, they noticed that there were footprints going away from the ship mm -hmm. of several men and a dog. And the, and the footprints never came back. So the ship had been abandoned. The, the, that sounds, given the fact that the wreck was found in precisely that area, yeah. that sounds like the final few men and their dog. And we know they had a dog. It was called Neptune. Mm -hmm. It sounds like the last survivors and the dog walked away. Yeah, um, you know the uh, your listeners among them. I hope is, is someone who can write fiction. 
You could write a great fictional account of the last survivor, which is probably Neptune the dog. Yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe they made it a distance onto the mainland, and, and it would be much more difficult to find evidence of that because on King William Island, uh, there's, there's very little, you know, there's no, there's no trees, there's no grass, there's you know, lichen and, and sm uh, small vegetation like that, uh, but it's very rocky and very flat. So b human remains and, and other things literally lie on the surface. People are stumbling across them all the time. Yeah. When you get onto the mainland, you get into marshy areas and other things. So if, if men were walking uh, and died there, it would be harder to find. But again, uh, if there is a written record on Erebus or Terror or both, quite possibly it is a last note that says, you know, we're down to five men and Neptune and we're walking out. The, the, the possibilities abound. Well, we, were, we just uh, mentioned a moment ago kind of how perhaps these men and, the, and uh, Sir John Franklin and Francis Crozier and the people that had to deal with this, how they may be viewed today, and pointing out again that we just found the ships like in the last few years. I think the first one was found in four, 2014, and then Terror was found in 2016. Um, what do you think are some of the most significant things we now know about this story and these ships that we didn't know maybe as early as 15, 20 years ago? Again, I urge people to look at the map that shows where both wrecks were found. And they are, they're due south of one another. And, and, the, and the two wrecks are due south of the place where they were abandoned, which the archaeologists call, call the point of abandonment. You can literally draw a straight line uh, north to south from the place where the ships were abandoned to the first wreck uh, to the which is the terror, uh, you know, by distance, and then the Erebus, which is the closest to the mainland. Now, the, the, anything is possible. They could have drifted to those locations as empty ghost ships. But again, uh, you know, in the book, I interview uh, uh, an expert who's an expert in ice flows and current flows up there. He has literally devoted his adult life to studying satellite images, he knows how ice moves up there better than anybody. Yeah. And he finds it highly unlikely that empty ships would end up where those two ships are. The, the, other, the other point about this is there are many, many hidden shoals and other hazards that if they were simply drifting with the ice, they could easily have been broken up, um, you know, by a, by a shoal or crushed by ice flows, etc., the terror itself is found in Terror Bay. Uh, that, that's a pure coincidence because Terror Bay was named by one of the, the search expeditions. It's purely a coincidence that the terror was eventually found there. But it's found in such a location that it's sort of, you'd have to sail in, into, a, again, a, a rather treacherous waters and into the bay. And to imagine an empty ship drifting through all of the things that had to get past and then drift up into into the middle of a bay, to me, it seems to be stretching uh, credulity. It, my heart tells me, again, experts will solve this problem, not me, but my heart tells me those ships were sailed there. Very interesting. Well, if uh, anybody listening didn't know anything about this story going into the show, or maybe you watched the show on AMC, or maybe you, you know studied parts of it somewhere else, uh, if you find this fascinating, and I don't know how you can't, because one of the reasons why that series was made, and I think one of the reasons why Paul could write such a great book, is because there's such continued interest in this. And as we just pointed out, there's still a lot we can find out in the coming years. But in the meantime, I want to recommend that everyone go out and find uh, or go get online and get Ice Ghost, the epic hunt for the Lost Franklin Expedition by Paul Watson. I, I got mine on... Uh, at Amazon, and I've also found the audio version of the book as well, because I was doing both. <laughs> so I drive to work, and I'd listen to it that way, and then I had the hard copy as well. And we will have links to get those on the website, as well as uh, places to find Paul. Outside of getting the book, Paul, is there other places that uh, you would like people to check out something you're working on or to follow you online? Well, you know, strangely enough, I'm, I'm working on a new book. I haven't sold sold the idea to anyone yet. Um, but I can say stay tuned. Okay. 
you know, they, I, I don't look for this stuff. They sort of find me. But this one has <laughs> this one has a supernatural element too. You know, another true story, but a modern story. I have a website. I invite people to to look for. It's um, it's called. It's a bit long, but Arctic Star Creativity dot com. So you know, Arctic Star Creativity dot com. And I'm on Twitter at Where War Lives. Well, Paul, I really appreciate your time today. It's It's been a fascinating discussion. Uh, it was great to be able to talk about this book. You provide so much really good, insightful information, way beyond anything you could definitely get from a TV series. Uh, that was just kind of a starting point for me. But uh, you have a great book here, and I'm so glad we had a chance to talk about it. And, and really, as we, we discussed it, it was really great to have a chance to talk about everything that happened then and now and remember everything that these guys went through uh, for for the glory of finding the Northwest Passage, but really what we remember them as now, as they as we have a chance to really see what brave and and really gutsy guys these these men were and everything they went through, it's really good to have a chance to discuss them and remember them as everybody has a chance to revisit the history in the book. And I appreciate your time to get a chance to do that today. You're you're very kind, and I really enjoyed it. You know, you you get my heart beating again anytime I think of those men. And also, as you point out, Lady Franklin, uh, mm-hmm. you know, brave, brave woman defending, um, defending them like nobody else could. That's right. Thanks again. <laughs>